go ahead and get started. And I'm going to have a word of prayer. All right. Father, um, man, thank you so much for this medium that we have, Lord, to be able to meet together. And who would have ever thought, you know, several years ago that we would have this technology. And so we thank you for that. We realize that all wisdom comes from you. And uh, so, Lord, thank you. Thank you that we can meet together as a, as a church family. And Lord, as we uh, discuss, Lord, what I think is just a really important topic, I pray that you'd give wisdom. Um, Lord, as I read this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we realize that the Holy Spirit of God is our teacher. And so we submit ourselves today to the Holy Spirit and ask that he would uh, speak to us and he would speak through us as well. We love you, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so I am sending, you should have some notes. Uh, I hope you got those notes. If you don't have them they, yet, they should be in your email, and I would encourage you to go back and uh, get them. And I apologize, I was a little late today, so it was a busy weekend, and I actually didn't finish everything till about, probably about 30 minutes ago, and so got everything finished, so you should have those notes. So, so today I want to have a conversation about the coronavirus and the sovereignty of God. So if you watch the message yesterday, I made a pretty bold statement in the message. I made a statement that God has a purpose and a plan for this pandemic. And not just a purpose and the plan for this pandemic globally. I mean, we all would sit back and say, yeah, God's trying to accomplish something globally and maybe even nationally. But, but I believe with all of my heart that God has a purpose and a plan for you. And as we talked about yesterday, a purpose and a plan for your family as well. And so I, I guess I would say, first of all, if you didn't watch the message, go back and watch it, um, you know, Self-plug right there, pretty good message. And so uh, uh, I apologize for the way the guy looks and everything, but, uh, but, 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 but wasn't a bad message. But I'd encourage you to go back and watch. And I'd even encourage you to share with others. I think it's a message that was encouraging and, and relevant to a lot of people. But, but such a thought, the idea that God has a purpose and a plan, even for something as tragic as the coronavirus, leads us, though, to ask several questions. And so I put in your notes, I put some just thought-provoking questions. The first is this, why has God allowed the COVID-19 crisis? Um, how can God allow so much pain and suffering? And by the way, that's an extremely relevant question that a lot of people in our world are asking. So uh, I just checked in the last few minutes. So the death statistics as of right now, there's almost 80,000 people who have died in the United States, 1,735 in the state of Florida, 258 in Broward County. But I think even more than that, um, all of us have heard the experiences of suffering. I think we're all grateful that we're healthy and that you know, so far, you know, we haven't been infected, at least as far as we know, with the virus. But, you know, you sit back and you, and you read stories of how, you know, the virus is randomly affecting certain people. Certain people get it and they just have mild symptoms. And then other people who seemingly are healthy beforehand are just all of a sudden just knocked down and, you know, spend weeks in the hospital. Some of them are a ventilator and some of them, you know, don't even make it. Um, Darren Bennett, who's a pastor in, in South Florida, Darren Bennett's brother, who was a police officer for Broward County. Um, Darren's brother was in his thirties and he got the coronavirus and, and died, just suddenly died. And so we sit back and, and we listen to all of that suffering. You've probably read stories of family members who, you know, one, two, three, four family members have gotten the virus. And then two, three, four people in a family have, have died as a result of it. And we sit back and say, man, why in the world, if God is omnipotent, why is God allowing all of this pain and suffering? Which leads us to the question of, does he care? I mean, 
I mean, does God really care? And that's what a lot of atheists and agnostics ask the question, you know, you know, does God care? Is God emotionally moved by our suffering? And I think, you, you know, the simple answer to that is yes. And you only have to go to John chapter 11 to see the answer for that, because Whenever Lazarus died, remember the story in John chapter 11 and Lazarus died and we find in verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible that just says Jesus wept. So, so even though Jesus knew he was omnipotent, even though he knew he had the power to heal, even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he was moved in that moment, you know, by his emotions. So yes. But then the other question that that leads us to is if, 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 um, let me just mute everybody there. Um, if, if he's moved by the suffering, then why doesn't he just stop it? <laughs> All right. So, so, so if God is omnipotent, which we believe he is, if he is all loving, which we believe that he is, why in the world would God allow all of this to happen? The, the, those are deep questions. And in reality, those questions lead us to deeper philosophical questions. They lead us to deeper theological questions. And I put those in your notes. Why does God allow pain and suffering? And then the, the even deeper question is, where does evil come from? So even if we sit back and all of us would say, okay, this coronavirus is evil, man. It's wicked. It, uh, I mean, what it does in, in somebody's body is just absolutely wicked. Well, where does evil come from? So, so is, is God the creator of the coronavirus? And if God's the creator of the coronavirus, how do you justify his love and his care and his compassion with, with the creation of something that is so destructive? Um, you know, the other question is, who is really in control? You know, some would sit back and say, boy, God would do something if he could, but he's just not able. And so is he in control? You know, the old, I wish I would have looked up the quote, you know, the old, you know, saying about, you know, is God in control or is, you know, or is he just, you know, kind of maniacal in the fact that he enjoys seeing his creation suffer? There's some people that think that. Um, and if so, why can't he just eliminate human suffering? It goes beyond coronavirus. I mean, you know, you, you look at children starving around the world. You look at, you know, sex trafficking that's happening at, a, at an enormous rate. You know, you look at genocide, you know, that happens in countries where political leaders go in and they just wipe out whole segments of society. And the list could go on and on and on. Where is God in all of this? And if we say that God is sovereign and God's in control, why does God allow it? And why doesn't God put an end to it? All right. So that's what we're going to dive into today. All right. So, so let me just say right up front that those are questions that have been uh, debated for centuries. So, so, so I don't pretend that in the next you know, 30 minutes, we're going to answer that question in a satisfactory way. But, but I do want to give you some things to think about, and I want to give you and anybody who will be watching this later on, so, you know, a biblical basis for what we believe. Because if we're not careful, a situation like this does one or two things for us. It either weakens our faith or it strengthens our faith. So, so as you go through a struggle, it either weakens your faith, which a lot of people sit back and throw their hands up in the air, especially when they lose a loved one and say, I don't know why God allowed me to, to go through this, but I don't believe a loving God would allow somebody to go through this. Or it strengthens our faith. It drives us to him. And so obviously what we want is we want our faith to be strengthened through all of this. So um, I want to start. There's a lot of different places we could have started. But I want to start, if you have your outline right there in front of me, I want to start with a point, which I think we always start with God. So, so every single um, debate that we have, every single reasoning that we have, it always goes back to God. By the way, that's the way the Bible started, right? In the beginning, God. So, so before, before the world was ever created, before sin ever came into the world, before any virus ever existed, before any of that, God existed. So he is the one with whom we always 
starts, okay? So, so the first thing I wrote in your notes is this, as an all-powerful God, God is sovereign over all his creation. And we'll define that word sovereign in, in, in just a moment. Um, you know, you might sit back and say, Brian, is the word sovereign in the Bible? Well, well, depending upon your translation, all right? So if you use the NIV, I'm not sure whether we have any NIV fans here. If you use the NIV, the word sovereign is found some 250 times in the Bible. Uh, the NIV is what we call a dynamic equivalent, so it's a thought by thought. The, the, the NIV is translated thought by thought and not word by word. And so it takes the thought, the idea of sovereignty that obviously is in Scripture, and it translates that. The more literal translations, though, the ESV, the King James, and other ones, the word sovereign is not found in those translations. Those translations use the word Lord instead of the word sovereign. But, but I say all that just to say this, even though the word sovereign might not be found in our Bibles, the truth is very clear in Scripture that God is sovereign. So here's what I want to do. I want to take a few moments, and I want us to look at Scripture. So, you know, more importantly than what does Brian say about this, we need to know about what the Bible says about this. So if you got a Bible right there, I, re I really want you to follow along with me, and I want you to see these verses. I want you to see them um, with your own eyes, and I want you to hear them with your own ears, and I want you to read them uh, um, or understand them with your own heart, all right? So we're going we're gonna to do just a, a really brief five or six verse summary of the sovereignty of God through Scripture. And this isn't exhaustive, but it does give us an idea. So we'll start in Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. If you're familiar with that passage, that's, that's the story of Joseph. And Joseph been sold into slavery by his brothers and, you know, ended up, you know, in, a, in an Egyptian prison for, you know, some 18, 19 years, and then um, God miraculously brought him out, and he became second in command over all of Egypt. You know the story. And so at the end of his father's life, Joseph's brothers, who he's reunited with, think, okay, dad's gone. Now Joseph's going to kill us. And Joseph makes a great statement as to the sovereignty of God. So if you have your Bible there in Genesis 50 and verse 20, Joseph makes this statement. He says, as for you, speaking to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me. But notice what he says, but God meant it for good to bring it, um, to bring it to doubt that many people should be kept alive. I think I messed up the translation there as they are today. So, so here's what Joseph is saying, and, and very early before theology was ever formalized and everything, Joseph makes this profound statement of the fact that what? God is in control of the situation. So even though his brothers had sold him into slavery, even though Potiphar's wife had lied about him, even though he spent almost two decades in prison, all these people meant it for evil in his life. He said this, God meant it for good. So, so, so does that make sense? So here's what Joseph is saying, that, that the plan of God overarches even the evil plans of man. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So, 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 so that is so very important for us because even when someone treats us badly, even when someone, um, you know, does not treat us the way we deserve and, you know, whatever we receive, it's easy for us to get bitter. It's easy for us to get hardened. It's easy for us to, you know, shout out that I don't deserve to be treated that way. But here's what we got to understand that God's sovereignty, his sovereign control, and we'll define it in a second of the universe, even overarches the evil intentions of man. So, so in Joseph's life, Joseph is saying, my brothers weren't in control. Potiphar wasn't in control. Pharaoh wasn't in control. Who was in control? God was in control. And so we see even early on in Scripture this teaching of the sovereignty of God. 
So go with me to the second verse, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. Second Chronicles chapter 20. And you'll see, I'll just take you chronologically through some of these verses. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. This is the prayer of Jehoshaphat, and we won't take the time to get into the context, but, but Jehoshaphat makes this statement as he's praying. He said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And notice what he says. You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. So here's Josephat really early on in Israel's history, recognizing that what? That it's God who's over kings. It's God who's over governments. It's God who's over presidents. God is the one who is in control. He rules over all kingdoms, all right? Let me show you another verse, Psalm 37, 23. If you've heard of Vicki and my testimony, you know that this is, hey, Lauren, welcome on. Lauren's coming on. Um, if you've heard Vicki and my testimony, you know that this verse means a lot to me because this is a verse that God has used to, for us to understand what he's doing in our life through Amber. So this is a verse God gave me. Just take a 30 second. When Amber was in the hospital, one of the times that she almost died, I was in Mexico, Vicki was in the United States, and I was kind of arguing with God all night long, you know, the old poor me, God, why have you allowed this to happen? You know, don't you know that I'm serving you? You, you know, you're not in control of all of this. And, and this verse just jumped off the page one night and spoke to me. But David says this, the steps of a man are established by God or by the Lord. When he delights in his way, though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong for the, old, the Lord upholds his hand. The, the key word is the word established right there. So, so, so the idea is that God is the one who orders and directs and establishes our steps. So, so whatever happens in my life, whatever happens in yours is not random. It's not chance. There's a sovereign God who's controlling each and every one of those events. That was life changing for me. For me to sit back and realize God didn't make a mistake with Amber, all right? He didn't. She's exactly the way God wants her to be. And God has ordained that for us, all right? Why? Because he is sovereign. Let me give you a couple other verses quick. Uh, Psalm 115 and verse 3. Psalm 115 and verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Pretty straightforward, right? Who's in charge? God is. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. I'm going to run through these. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So in other words, we can, we can make plans, but who is the one that makes it come to pass? God is the one who makes it come to pass. There's even another verse. Some of you might know it, and I didn't look it up, but, but there's, a, there's a verse that has the idea of casting lots or throwing dice, that the verse says this. This is Brian's translation. Man throws the dice, but God makes the numbers come up. And so the, that's such a great verse that talks about the sovereignty of God. So let me give you one more verse, and you know this one, Romans 8, 28. If you haven't memorized this one, that would be a great verse to memorize. Romans 8, 28. Paul says, For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So there's about six or seven verses right there, all right? And we could probably give you another 20, but there's six or seven verses that, that show us whether it's our lives or whether it's nations or whether it's kingdoms, God is in control, all right? So that leads us to the word that we're talking about. It's the word sovereignty. So I've kind of put just a, a, a simple definition. I, I could have given you something a little bit more deep, but I wanted to give you something really simple. So, so, so here's a simple way to define the sovereignty of God. 
there are no limits. Sorry, that should be no. It says not. There are no limits to God's rule. All right? There are no limits to God's rule. He is absolute Lord over every aspect of his creation. All right? That's basically, in a nutshell, the sovereignty of God. So God's on the throne. And we actually believe, you know, from an eschatological point of view, we can talk about that, but, but, but we believe that Jesus is actually on the throne right now. But, but God is on the throne, all right? He, the, and there are no limits to his rule. It's not like he's handcuffed. It's not like, you know, there's only certain things he can do and other things that he can't do. There are no limits to his sovereign rule. He is absolute Lord over all creation. So, so I gave a quote from John Piper there. Let me read that quote. So John Piper says this, whenever God acts, he acts in a way that pleases him. He is never constrained to do a thing that he despises. He is never backed into a corner where his only recourse is to do something he hates. He does whatever he pleases. He's what? He's sovereign. All right. So, so, so I'm going somewhere with this. I kind of wanted to lay a foundation. So, 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 so I want to be honest. So there's three main views uh, in regard to the sovereignty of God. So I need you to put your theological hats on, and I'm going to give you three deep views of the sovereignty of God. All right? I don't agree with all of these, but I want to give them to you. Okay? So, so the first one is this. And it's that man has free will. Man has complete free will. If, um, if you know anything about terminology, it's what we call the Arminian view. All right? That's A-R-M-I-N-I-A-N, -I -I the Arminian view. So, so here's what this means. It means this, that God created man with a free will to make all of his own decisions, and that freedom comes with consequences. So, so what that view basically does when we look at COVID-19, when we look at genocide, when we look at all of that, that takes the blame off of God. And it's easy to sit back and say, well, God created man with free will. And so man is living the consequences of his sinful nature. All right. So, so that's the free will point of view. Okay. The second one, and this is the one I have more problem with than anything, is what's called open theism, all right? I think I gave you that to write in, just O-P-E-N, open theism, all right? This is, the, this is a concept that is really growing, um, even in evangelical circles, which is scary to me. So, so here's what that means. It means that God doesn't know everything, all right? God doesn't know the future. He doesn't know the future decisions that his free creatures are going to make. Therefore, God can't control their decisions, nor can God control their outcomes. All right, so just to give you a, an idea, so maybe you know what you're going to eat for supper tonight, but God doesn't know what you're going to eat for supper tonight. All right, that's open theism. God, God doesn't know the future. There's certain aspects of his creation that he doesn't know. And so he doesn't know what the future holds. And so as a result, he doesn't know what the consequences of those decisions are going to be. That's open theism. It's actually growing in popularity in, in evangelical circles. The third concept is this, and we're just going to bounce off of these. The third concept is God sovereignly determines all things. All right, so God sovereignly determines all things. If, if, if you want to put a word beside it, that's what we call the Reformed position. So the first one is the Arminian position. This is the Reformed position. I gave you um, a quote from the London Baptist Convention, which dates all the way back to the 1800s. And so the London Baptist Convention says this, God, the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, doth 
uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and all things from the greatest even to the least by the most wise and holy providence to the end for which they were created according unto his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. All right, there you go. You're getting not only a, uh, a uh, theology lesson, but you're getting a church history lesson right there, the London Baptist Confession, which was written in the 1800s. So, so if you sit back and say, okay, so Brian, where are you in all of this? All right, um, I, was, uh, I was raised probably in more of a free will position, um, you know, the man was created with complete free will, but the more I studied the scriptures, the more and more I am believing in the sovereignty of God, that, 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 that God sovereignly controls everything. And obviously we're not going to get into, you know, the whole salvation aspect of it and, you know, predestination and all of that today. But, but if God is sovereign, then, then he's either in control or he's not in control, right? Does that make sense? So, 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 so it's not like you can partially be in control. He's either omnipotent and he's sovereign or he's not. And, and, and so I would say this, I would say, even though I believe that, that there is a sense of, of us underneath God's supervision, there is a sense that we have free will to do certain things, but ultimately it plays back onto the sovereignty of God with all of that. So I say three things, and then I want to get into a little bit of how it relates with this. So I put a thing called the extent of God's sovereignty. So we saw that God is sovereign over the universe. Remember, we saw that in the, um, we saw that in the verses we read, he rules over kingdoms, he rules over princes, he rules over everything. He is sovereign over the universe. Secondly, I put, he is sovereign over salvation. So Jesus not only died to offer salvation to the world, but also to bring his people to himself, to overcome the rebellion, and to gather them omnipotently, omnipotently to himself. So I'm sure you've thought about this, and if you ever, we'll talk about the, the doctrine of salvation one day. But when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, and we're going to talk about the consequences of that in a second, but when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, God didn't throw his hands up in the air and say, oh my word, now what am I going to do? <laughs> All right, I created these people. I wanted them to live perfectly and they've sinned. Now what am I going to do? Now I got to come up with a plan. No, no, we believe that God in his sovereignty had everything meticulously planned, even from the moment of, of creation. And, and we even see that because in Genesis 3.15, before, and we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3 in a second, and we'll actually see the verse, but before he actually even gives the condemnation to Adam and Eve, he, he lays out the plan of salvation. And so, and so we see the sovereignty of God in our salvation. And then he, he, here's the third one, and this is what ties in with all of us we see that God is sovereign over suffering. So he's not only sovereign over the universe, he's not only sovereign over salvation, but we believe that he's sovereign over suffering. And I say it this way, let me say it slowly, just in case you want to write this down. The ultimate reason that suffering exists in the universe, so this might be the most profound statement I make today. The ultimate reason that suffering exists in the universe is so that Jesus might display the greatness and the glory of God by suffering in himself to overcome our suffering. All right, I'm going to read that again, okay? The ultimate reason that suffering exists in the universe, it's so that Jesus might display the grace or the, excuse me, might display the greatness of the glory of the grace of God by suffering himself to overcome our suffering. So, so in other words, here's what suffering does. It, it points us to Jesus. 
It just reminds us over and over again that we desperately need Jesus. And it reminds us that God is not aloof. He's not disconnected. He, he's not unconcerned with what we're going through. To the contrary, Jesus suffered not only like us, but Jesus suffered for us. And the whole purpose of suffering is to display the greatness of God. So, so, so that's deep. So we could end it right there. And we could say that why does God allow COVID-19? And why does God allow death? And why does God allow human suffering? Well, first of all, because all of that points us to Jesus. And Jesus is the ultimate sufferer, all right? And it and, and doesn't matter what type of suffering that we go through. God gets it. God comprehends it, whether it's the loss of a child, whether it's physical pain, whatever it is, he gets it because he is the ultimate sufferer. So, 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 so even though agnostics and atheists can accuse God of being uncaring and, and disconnected, that argument doesn't hold any water whatsoever, because that would be true if God was up in heaven, sitting on a throne, disconnected from all the suffering that we're going through. But that's not the case. He sent his only son, Jesus, who suffered even more than you and I will ever suffer. And he completely gets our suffering. Does that make sense? So, so, so I want to talk about a second thing, and I'm going to try to be done in time for us to answer questions. So the second part of all of this is this. In the fall, man became subject to the curse and the consequences of sin. <clears throat> and so I want to read some passages of Scripture. So if you have your Bibles with me, once again, I want to read through three different passages, starting all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3. So obviously Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve fall into sin. We know all of that. So I want to start reading in verse 15, and I want you to see this if you get your Bible. This is, this is good, deep stuff. So in verse 14, he, he condemns the serpent. Then in verse 15, which if you remember, verse 15 is the first mention of the gospel in the Bible. All right, it's vague, but it's the first mention of the gospel. And so God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So, so, so God is speaking to the serpent and he's speaking about that, that God would what? He's going to put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman, which ultimately is Jesus Christ, stating that Jesus would bruise the head of the serpent, even though the serpent would just bruise the heel of the offspring of the woman. So we, bought, we all know that, that which one of those bruises is fatal. Uh, a blow to the head or a blow to the heel? A blow to the head, right? So, so here's, what, here's what God is saying. As a result, the, the woman is going to produce an offspring which will bring a fatal blow to you. So, so what do we have? We have the very first vague mention of the gospel there right after the fall. So let me continue. Verse 16, he says, To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So he talks about the, fa the, the, the fact that the childbearing will be painful. That phrase, your desire will be to your husband, is the idea about it. You ever wonder why it just seems like as husbands and wives we beat heads all the time? So there's just like this, the, 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 there's just like this, this, this conflict, this innate conflict is a result of the fall. So now you have two people that have strong wills and they're kind of beating against each other. And Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and ashes it shall bring forth to you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread or you shall... Or, or, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. 
and you are dust and to dust you shall return. All right. So what do we see there? Right there, we see the consequences of the fall. So he looks at Adam and Eve and all of us and says, man, because of your sin, here's what's going to happen. And we know they were kicked out of paradise. We know that not only were they kicked out of paradise, but, but, but all of the tragedies of life begin what? Begin after the fall. All right. So everything from pain, everything from sickness to death was the result of sin entering into the world. I want to show you another passage. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. <coughs> Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. This is kind of a the glorious aspect of it. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25, if you can find it. So let me read it. Paul is writing. By the way, we begin a study of Romans this coming Sunday. I'm excited about that. So we're going to go passage by passage, the first five chapters of Romans, all the way through summer, all the way through August. So we're excited about that. Romans 8.18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Let me just, so just pause for a second and let that sink into your mind and heart. So, so what are the sufferings of the present time? <laughs> Coronavirus, death, all of those things. And so Paul says that, that what you're going through right now does not compare with the glory that you're going to receive in the future. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So deep words there, but here's what Paul is saying. So all of creation was put in subjection when? When, when sin entered into the world. And so this perfect world that was free, we believe, of sin, that was free of viruses, even though there's some debate as to whether some viruses existed because, you know, whether plants lived forever back then, we don't know. But I don't think any virus exist, uh, existed. I don't think any type of fatal disease existed. None of that existed until what? Until sin entered into the world. So all of a sudden, sin enters into the world. And this perfect world that was, you know, just revealing the glory of God has now been subjected to futility. Pain, disease, death, all of those things. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Do you ever feel that way when you wake up in the morning and say, okay, Lord, get me out of this body, <laughs> all right? We're all, we're feeling it, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes and what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So what is Paul talking about? He's talking about this, this pain, all of these things that we're experiencing, one day will be eliminated. All right, and, and creation will go back to what it was always intended to be. Let me show you one more verse. So go with me to Revelation chapter 21, the end of the Bible. Revelation 21, verse 4. So, so I love this. This is what we're looking for. Revelation 24, it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So there's our hope. So just to, you know, really personal, um, two days ago was Amber's 26th birthday. So her birthday is always difficult for us. Obviously, we're so grateful that she's still alive, but it's been a difficult 26 years. And... Um, so what do we look forward to? <laughs> we look forward to the day when there's not going to be any more pain, 
not going to be any more suffering. All of that is going to be over. And that's all going to happen. You know, we talked two weeks ago about when Jesus comes back and the timing of all of that. But all of that is going to happen when Jesus returns and he takes this fallen creation and he restores it back to what God always intended for it to be. But for the moment, we're living in a fallen world. And we're living in a world that is suffering the consequences of sin. Weeds in our garden, pain in our joints, viruses in our community, all of that, all of those are the results of the fact that we live in a fallen world. So, so I've given you a quote um, there in your notes by a man named Kevin DeYoung. Kevin Pastors in North Carolina. And he made this statement that I thought was really good. He said, the coronavirus is a natural evil under God's providential control, to be sure, but whose existence is the result of original sin. The root of all human pain and suffering in the world is the rebellion of our first parents, a rebellion that Christ conquered on the cross and will one day wipe away along with all its sad and sinister effects, right? So, so, so you might sit back and say, well, Brian, that doesn't give me a lot of hope right now. <laughs> so, so, so what happens if I get the virus? What happens if my family member gets the virus? How do we get hope in the midst of all of that? Well, well, I wish I could look at you and say, you know, that Christ offers healing over all of that. And obviously we believe that God can heal. He has the power to heal, but he obviously often chooses not to heal. Some of our, um, some of our charismatic friends would take, you know, Isaiah chapter 53 and, you know, take that phrase that says, by his stripes we are healed, meaning that Jesus died on the cross to heal all of our infirmities. Well, if that was the case, nobody would ever die. <laughs> and, and, and we all die. And by the way, we're all going to die of something. So at some point, if it's not the coronavirus that gets us, something is going to get us. Why is that? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? It's death. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. Um, I quote in a lot of funerals, George Bernard Shaw made the statement. He said, the statistics of death are quite impressive. One out of every one person dies. <laughs> and that's true. I mean, I wish I could give all of us more hope when it comes to our life here, but I can't. Why is that? Because we live in a fallen world and we all are experiencing the consequences of sin. And our hope is not in this present world. So our hope is not in a vaccine. Our hope is not in medication. And, and I'm like you, I hope they get it. I mean, I hope they get a medicine. I hope this remdesphere works or all of this stuff. I hope it works. But at the end of the day, if coronavirus doesn't get us, something is going to get us. Why is that? Because the result of a fallen world is death. And, and we need to realize that. And so that doesn't mean that God's not in control. It doesn't mean that, you know, he's, he, he doesn't care about what is going on. He has allowed sin to enter into the world so that his glory might be manifested through the person of Jesus Christ. So, so I want to give you just about five or six purposes of the coronavirus and then We'll open it up for, for, for questions. So I've given these to you. You don't have to write anything down, okay? So, so when we sit back and say, okay, so why would God allow this to happen? And quite frankly, all of us are probably still in shock. So who would have ever imagined, you know, back in January that the entire world would shut down? No, none of us would have ever imagined that. I mean, and it's not just here. I mean, I'm, I'm in communication with pastors all over the world. I mean, Claudio Jimenez, our missionary in Argentina, completely shut down in Argentina. Yesterday, we were on the phone with Justin and Jenny in Guatemala, completely shut down in Guatemala. Who would have ever imagined this would happen in our lifetime? Why is God allowing this to happen? What is his ultimate purpose? And at the end of the day, 
I would say this, there are global purposes, there are individual purposes. And God in his omnipotence and God in his sovereignty is able to be working all of these purposes out for his good. Remember, we, we ended our initial verses with Romans 8.28. And God uses what? He uses all things. He works all things for his good. So, so here's the crazy thing. That God in his sovereignty is able to have a pandemic plan for Brian. He's able to have a pandemic plan for Lisa. He's able to have a pandemic plan for Millie, for Kathy, for Matt. For all of us, he is able to have a specially formulated, designed plan that he is using this pandemic to accomplish his will in our lives. So, so if you notice, my main theme yesterday was this, don't waste a good pandemic. In other words, God is using this to accomplish something in our lives, in our community, in our church, in our world. So he's big enough to do all of that at the exact same time. So here's just a couple of things that God is, I believe, accomplishing. Some of these might apply to you and some of them might not. But first is this, he's weaning believers off of some of our idols. All right. I can't talk about your idols, but I can talk about mine. I'm an absolute sports fanatic. So uh, at night during this time of year, I'm watching the Miami Heat almost every single night, all right? So all of a sudden, guess what? There is no sports to watch. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm on Saturday. Saturday's my sports day. It's football or golf or something. I told Vicky on Saturday, I said, there's not a single sporting event on that I can watch. What if God's sitting back saying, you know, Brian, those sporting events are an idol in your life. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take them out of your life for about three months. Uh, what is he doing? To me, he's weaning the idols from my life. I mean, he might be doing the same thing to you. It's giving families a renewed desire to be together. One of the things that I'm seeing is I'm communicating with families all the time is, is families who used to be so rushed and never had any time together. Guess what they have now? They have time to spend together and they're spending time together. Even Vicki and I, I mean, Vicky and I hadn't eaten lunch together except maybe one day a week for years. And now guess what we get to do every day? We eat lunch together every, except uh, Tuesdays is the one day I'm at the office now. So every other day we eat lunch together. It's allowing us time to spend together. Here's what it does too. It reminds us of the reality of death. I'm not sure if we talked about this. I talk about a lot of things, but, but we live in a culture that avoids death at all at all costs, all right? We wanna, we wanna make it as benign as possible. That's not the reality. As a matter of fact, most of the world live with the reality of death. And so we've kind of, we've kind of insulated ourselves from death. And I think God's reminding us, no, no death, death's a reality of life. <laughs> Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed a man once to die. You cannot avoid it. So here's another one. It's driving believers and unbelievers to the word of God. So, so I put there, it, it slowed us down. I was reading a statistic the other day that says Google searches for Bible verses are up 800% in this pandemic crisis. They say that they cannot keep Bibles on the shelves right now. What is this doing? It's driving people to God's word. It's reigniting a passion for prayer. In believers. We realize that our only hope is in Jesus. And so, I mean, we're praying together more online than ever before. It opens doors for us to share our faith. And lastly, it points us to the second coming. So it reminds us, Romans chapter 8, it reminds us that all of this is temporary. You know, let, let's be honest, and I'm done. I mean, we've, we've been so spoiled in the United States that, that compared to most of the world, we have pretty much of a, of a luxury, you know, a luxury living, all right? And, and there's, there's no need. I mean, why do we want Jesus to come back when I have everything I want here on earth, you know? I mean, I, I mean quite frankly, I mean, 
you know, we eat the best of everything. We have air conditioned homes. We got, you know, we have pools in our neighborhoods. We can go jump in. We got cars. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus coming back's good, but I don't know whether I want him to come back right away. Life is pretty good right here. And I think the reality of something like this reminds us, no, 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 the, this is not where we want to put down roots. Our roots are with him in the second coming. So the sovereignty of God in the coronavirus, is God sovereign over this? He absolutely is. All right. I mean, does he specifically want people to suffer? I think his heart breaks at the suffering of others as well. But in his sovereign plan, he's using all of this to accomplish his ultimate purpose, which is to glorify Jesus, to glorify himself and drive us to him. So that's all I got. So, so, so I, did, I did have one little thing right here. Let me just say this and then I'm done. So God is in control. So depend upon him to do what is right. God has a purpose. So watch for him to work. God will provide. So trust in him to deliver. God has a mission. So declare his truth abroad. And God has a remedy. So praise him for what he will do. He's in charge. All right. I'm going to shut up. Anybody have any questions? I'm going to unmute everybody. Here we go. All right. Anybody have a question? Come on, somebody throw something difficult at me. Yeah, Kathy. I can't hear you, Kathy. Yeah, your sound's not working. Oh. It shows it's working, but it's not working. Kathy, you could type in, do a chat and type in. So, so hit chat at the bottom and type in a question. Can you see that? If you type in a question, I can answer it. Okay, so while she's doing that, who else? Who else has a question? Come on, somebody challenge me on something. <laughs> no, impossible. Oh. She got it. Anybody have a question? So, 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 so let me give you something to think about. So if... If God is sovereign over everything, uh, and obviously he created man with free will, so is God the originator of evil? So, uh, you, you know, that's the big, so, so, so the big theological question, that's what they call a theodicy, you know, the, the problem of evil. Where does evil come from? So if ultimately God is the creator of everything, all right, and we believe nothing has been created that was not created by him, where does evil come from? That's something for you to think about. I'm not going to answer that question right now, but it's something. First of all, I'm not going to answer because I don't think I have the answer, but, but um, <laughs> something to think about. Anybody else have a question? Did, um, I don't know whether Kathy wrote one in or not. And she said, is it fair to say God doesn't cause the virus, but he allows it to happen for his sovereign purpose? Um, that's a great question, Kathy. And, and I got to be honest, I struggle with that because if, if, if God is the creator of all things, all right, so nothing in our universe exists apart from him. All right, the, that's a tough one. You, you, you know, so, so, so here's a couple of arguments that, 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 that people would say. So people would say that, that, um, that evil and good are not necessarily something that's created, but evil and good e either magnify the presence of something or magnify the absence of something. And so some people would say that, that evil exists not because God created it, but evil exists as the result of not allowing God to be present in your life. And so whenever you have the absence of God in your life, the, the natural result of that is evil. Right? evil. Um, I tend to think all right, I, I, I'm going to throw myself out there. And I know we're recording this, and there's only 11 of you here. So if, uh, if you, you, 
you know, you guys lose respect for me and, and I get run off as the pastor of the church. So be it with all of that. I tend to, I'm such a sovereignty of God guy. I tend to think that somehow in God's ultimate plan that God has allowed all of this to happen. And God even uses evil and viruses for his glory. Now that's a tough one. That's an absolute tough one for an agnostic to swallow or an atheist to swallow. But, but I think it's really, so, 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 so here's where I struggle from a theological point of view. Can we differentiate the sovereignty of God? And so God is sovereign over this, but he's not sovereign over this. So God is in control over this, but he's not in control over this. All right. And that's where I struggle. So if, if, if he is, as we defined in our notes, we defined in our notes, I don't know whether I have it here somewhere, we defined sovereignty as what? There are no limits to God's rule. And he is absolute Lord over everything in creation. For us to sit back and say there is something in creation that didn't come from him, I think that undermines the sovereignty of God. Now, I also understand the problem with that, you know, because, because obviously God doesn't allow evil into his presence. So, so we know James chapter one, what does that verse say in, in, in James chapter one, that God doesn't tempt with evil. So God doesn't tempt with the, or God doesn't something evil and he doesn't tempt any man. So I think there's some real theological challenges with that. I don't know, but to me, I don't ever want to minimize the sovereignty of God in everything. To me, of all of God's attributes, his sovereignty is the crowning jewel of his attributes. And for me to sit back and say, and, and even when I was growing up, we would say, okay, Jesus isn't on the throne now. That Satan's the prince and the power of the air. So, so he has relegated his power to Satan. He's allowing him. And I got a huge problem with that theologically right now. I mean, because he, he, is he Lord or is he not Lord? All right. And, and if he's Lord, so, so, so the problem is that we try, to, we try to make all of these things rational in our human finite mind, and we cannot understand the mind of God. So what's that verse in Isaiah that, that God says, your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And, and we try to sit back and say, okay, God, you've got to fit into my box of rationale. God will never fit into our box of rationale. And so I really struggle with that, Kathy. I really do. And I know that's probably what you're struggling with too. I, I really struggle with it to the answer of that. And um, I've had to really wrestle with it in my mind, but I always go back to the sovereignty of God. And I'm not sure I would ever say to somebody, yeah, God created the coronavirus because I think there, I think that's that that is so of a, so much of a confusing statement to make. I think that it is the result of sin, yet God, in His sovereign plan, has allowed it to happen. I don't know whether that makes sense or not. Um, it, it is the result of the fact that we live in a fallen world, but to say that God has not had any sovereign control over it minimizes the sovereignty of God. I think I would say that, that it's the result of sin, it's the result of the fall, but God and his sovereignty has allowed it to happen and it's a part of his plan for our lives. Does that make sense? That makes it a little bit more, that makes it a little bit more palatable right there. I know Matt is probably itching to say something about that. Matt, do you want to say something? Huh? About to jump over the phone, no. Uh, no, what I was going to say was is that um, I think it was 2003 is when I was first exposed to the idea that um, that man doesn't have ultimate free will. I think that word free will carries a lot of baggage for a lot of people. And yeah. I think it's, I think it's better defined as does God have influences over our choices or does he not have influences over our choices? It's, it, you know, what it was, what it explained to me this way, you know, if there was a tornado coming down the street, would you go to McDonald's or would you go to McDonald's when the tornado wasn't coming down the street? And so it's one of those things where God is in control of our choices. It's that we are not free from the influences that God puts on us to, 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 for those choices to come about the way that he wanted them to happen. And so that was kind of like a, another way for me to kind of understand it. I'm not sure if that's 100% biblical. You can comment on that. What do you think? 
I think you're a heretic. I just think you're an absolute <laughs> heretic. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's a difficult concept. And, and to be honest with you, so wait till we get to, uh, I have intentionally waited 10 years to deal with the Book of Romans. So, so we are starting this Sunday, the Book of Romans. And thankfully, we're not going to make it to chapter nine this year. All right. We're going to go through the end of August. We're only getting to chapter five. Next year, we'll come back and we'll deal with, with uh, the next five chapters. But when you, you don't want to talk Romans, about Esau and Jacob at all? We're not going, we're not going to get there. We're not going to get to Esau have I loved and or, or, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. We're not going to get there. But, but you cannot, and especially when you're dealing with the area of salvation, which we're not, we're dealing with suffering today. When you're dealing with the area of salvation, you cannot interpret Romans chapter 9 a different way. That God has absolute sovereignty and he's involved in all of that and so um it, it's difficult for us to swallow uh with all of that but I'm, I'm a huge sovereignty of god guy i really am i've just seen it in my life so often and it gives me it gives me a port in a storm whenever a lot of things are happening that i don't understand to be honest with you i'm i'm not sure and i i might get emotional talking about this I, I'm not sure we would have made it through all the struggles we've gone through with Amber if we didn't believe that God was sovereign in all of that. Mm. And we didn't believe, you know, you know, nights in the hospital, you know, almost losing her so many times, seeing her in so much pain, so much suffering. If I believe that God wasn't sovereign over all of that and he didn't have an ultimate plan in that, I would have walked away and said, God, it's just not fair what you're doing. And, and I almost got there one night. I spent a night wrestling with God, absolutely wrestling with God. How dare you? How dare you treat us that way? And, and, and the port that I ended up in was the sovereignty of God. And if I hadn't have ended up there, I might have lost my faith, even as a pastor. Because apart from the sovereignty of God, it doesn't make any sense. But, but to realize that God uses even our suffering and somehow in his ultimate plan that only he understands, he uses all of this for his own greater good it is, is a place that I can rest. I don't understand it all, but I can rest in it. And I think that's where I get with this whole COVID crisis. And obviously it hasn't hit the Burkholder house yet, and I hope it doesn't, but I would hope that if it does, or whenever whatever hits us at some point, we're going to be able to rest in the sovereignty of God and realize he's in charge. He's in charge. I can trust him. I don't know why, but I can trust him. Amen. Any other questions? Any other questions you got? Nope. All right. So let's not all go out and tell people how heretical Matt is in his positions. All right. Let's not... <laughs> Let's not throw him under the bus with all that. It's okay. Oh, it's not the have, first time. What's that, Matt? I said, it's okay. It's not the first time. <laughs> all right. Let me have a word of prayer with you and we'll be done. All right. Father, thank you so much for the fact that you are a God who is in control. We trust you. We trust you. We don't understand what you're doing. We realize we live in a world that's filled with pain. We realize we live in a world that's filled with hurts. We realize that death is coming to our house. Suffering is coming to our house. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be for 10 years, but it's coming. And the answer is not found in us finding a human remedy. The answer is found in the fact that you understand suffering more than anybody else. Well, we can turn to you. And our hope is fully in Jesus. So, Lord, I pray you'd allow this truth to sink into our minds and hearts today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for letting me ramble for 60 minutes. I appreciate it. Huh? Thank you, Pastor, for My rambling. pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Bye, you have any questions? Any questions come to your mind? Email me. All right? Email have me. Have a great week. See All right. You. Love you guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.